Good afternoon to everyone with us gathered at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, as well as the online audience behind the screens. On behalf of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, I am delighted to welcome you all to today's conference. It is my honor to greet among us His Eminence Cardinal Grzegorz Rysz, Archbishop of Łódź. The focus of our conference in John Paul II's 1999 letter to artists and the opportunities and challenges in mutual relations between the church and culture throughout the centuries as well as today. The conference is possible thanks to the generous support of donors and friends of the Angelicum and of the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture, whom I would like to cordially thank. Today's conference will be opened by a presentation by Father Michael Paluch. We will then listen to a lecture by Professor Remy Brack. After a short break, we then invite our audience to a panel discussion with Cardinal Grzegorz Rysz, Father Ricardo Lufrani, and myself, moderated by Michał Kosowski. It is now my great honor to introduce to you the first speaker of today, Michał Paluch. Father Michał has been a member of the Dominican Order since 1987. He is a theologian, lecturer, and former rector of the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome. He specializes in fundamental theology, eschatology, and soteriology. He earned his doctorate in the history of dogmatic theology at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland in 2001, and a habilitation in philosophy from the Polish Academy of Sciences in 2013. During his academic career, he has lectured at Dominica House of Studies in Krakow and the Thomistic Institute in Warsaw, Poland, as well as the Angelicum in Rome. He was also a research scholar at the Institute of Church Life of Notre Dame University. Father Michał Paluch earned the title of Magister Sacre Theologiae in the Dominican Order in 2023. Today, Father Michał will introduce us to the most important points of John Paul II's 1999 Letter to Artists, which will be a reference point to the later panel discussion. Father Michał, the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind words, for this invitation, which is for me a true great honor. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Let's start this presentation with the words used to welcome the, the publication of Letter to Artists by the Polish poet and Nobel Prize winner Czesław Miłosz, which were published in the Krakow Weekly Tygodnik Powszechny. It was an unexpected, delightful, wonderful event. At the very end of a century of horrific wars and crimes, a wise and calm voice rang out, reminding us all of what has always been the purpose and vocation of art." End quote. One can certainly perfectly, un perfectly understand his enthusiasm. Czesław Miłosz was an artist of the same generation as John Paul II and shared many experiences with Karol Wojtyła. These included, in addition to his artistic work, of course, World War II or the struggle with communist ideology. However, I must confess that my reaction to this text, when I read it on the 25th anniversary of its publication, was somewhat different. Let me convey my impressions through an anecdote. During my studies in Krakow in the first half of the 1990s, together with a group of Dominican students, 
we organized a summer theological, theological seminar with Christoph Schenborn as our guest, then auxiliary bishop of Vienna, already widely known at the time as the head of the team working on the new edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. We then took the opportunity to interview him extensively. Having edited the text of our interview, we sent it to the editors of Tygodnik Powszechny. After a few days, the priest, who was then the weekly's ecclesiastical assistant, called us back, and the conversation with him was as follows. Is he a bishop? And, and yet he talks about all this in such a naive way? like a novice. I remember that at first I didn't know how to react, but then fortunately something clicked inside me and I responded, dear father, this is what is so unusual. Even though he is a bishop, he has retained the freshness of a novice's perspective. In a few days, the text appeared in the form we had sent earlier. I'm sharing this with you because I must confess that after I finished reading the letter, this story immediately came to my mind. As a response to the vision of the vocation of the artist outlined by John Paul II in this document, painted not only very positively, but even we could be tempted to say somewhat uncritically, we might feel like responding Holy Father, when was the last time you were in some well-known contemporary art gallery? Do you realize what has happened there over the past decades? Do you have any idea what they look like nowadays? Do you realize that in recent decades art has become an empty play of forms stripped of meaning and any metaphysical ambitions? As you can see, it is the reaction of mine which I would like to present as a provocation, an invitation to think that I will attempt to tackle. In doing so, I hope to implement the guiding idea of the St. John Paul II's Institute of Culture uh, at the Angelicum, which is that we are not here to simply repeat the thoughts of John Paul II, but rather we are here to learn to think with him about the world in which we live today. My introduction will consist of three parts. In the first, I will try to briefly present the ideological core of this document, or rather what I have understood as such. The second part will be a short collection of remarks which will be my attempt to grapple a little bit at least with the interpretation of the vocation of the artist and the understanding of beauty outlined by John Paul II. In the last part, I will try to indicate why this letter seems to me relevant today despite all the objections I will have raised. In my opinion, the letter to artists has three main points, which can be presented as follows. So first one, artistic activity is an imitation of the creator. The starting point of the reflection of the letter, setting the tone for the whole work, is a quote from the book of Genesis 1.31. God saw all that he made, had made, and it was very good. Since man was created in the image and likeness of God, it is necessary to think of this likeness to the creator dynamically. It is to say, it must be understood as realized primarily through action. Of course, one should never forget the gap between God bringing the world into existence out of nothing and man who can only process pre-existing matter or ideas. However, artistic creativity will always be the most perfect form of creatures approaching their divine origin. 
The Polish language has preserved an intuition of his relationship, the words Twórca, creator, and Twórca, craftsman, have the same root. Such an opening of the letter's reflections makes us think, of course, of John Paul II's Wednesday Catechesis, in which he very carefully tried to reflect on the first chapters of the book of Genesis. But it invites us also to keep in mind the programmatic starting point of his philosophy in person and act. After all, the entirety of the latter work is an attempt to rethink how the subject, through his or her actions, becomes fully himself, herself. Wojtyła devoted many years of his philosophical and theological work to building the foundation for the thesis presented at the beginning of the letter. This starting point has several rather obvious and immensely important implications, which will be articulated later in the letter. First of all, there is a certain continuity between all truly human action and artistic creation. Artistic creation is a special case, the pinnacle of all attempts to imitate the creator through human action. Further, the climax of artistic creativity is an existential transformation that brings out the fullness of our humanity. Finally, and consequently, creativity is a revelation of the human person through the undertaken action and thus an invitation to dialogue at the deepest level. The first claim with its implications is completed by the second claim, which is in fact already contained in the quote from Genesis that opens the whole discussion. So the second claim, just as there is an intrinsic connection between goodness and beauty in God's work, so is artistic activity supposed to be an expression of beauty intrinsically connected with goodness. Of course, the background of this claim is the famous platonic kalokagatia, the idea of beauty, goodness. However, as John Paul II rightly points out, this idea is confirmed in the Bible already in Old Covenant times, since the translators of the Septuagint decided to render the Hebrew term top by the Greek kalon. Thus, the words of Genesis, God saw all that he, made, he had made, and it was very good, sound in Greek, and it was very beautiful, will clearly articulate a very similar idea to Plato's Kalokagatia from at least the third century BC. The second thesis opens up the space for reflection that allows one to see artistic activity as a service for the community and the responsibility to others, for example, as the art of education. Interestingly, in his letter, the Pope merely touches on this topic in number four without extensively elaborating on it. The two presented claims lead us to the third one, which thoroughly permeates the last part of the text. The unsurpassed pinnacle of artistic creativity, beauty linked to goodness, is given to Christians in the mystery of the Incarnation. In the end, it is Christ who becomes for us the ultimate model of divine and human action. It is through him that we find the fullness of humanity and consequently the best image of the link between beauty and goodness. It is hardly surprising then that ultimately the Incarnation is the primary inspiration for Christian art and its most important theme. I hope that this concise 
outline of the main claims of the letter faithfully captures the speculative background of the document. However, it certainly doesn't reflect its underlying backdrop and passion. The underlying backdrop of the whole is rendered by the selection of the cited authors and artists. As usual in John Paul II's documents, the range is rich and multidimensional. The Pope refers to authors ranging from Plato, St. Augustine and Macarius the Great to St. Thomas, Paul Florensky and Fyodor Dostoevsky. He also outlines the development of Christian art in subsequent eras, mentioning artists as diverse as Paulinus of Nola, Dante, Fra Angelico, Orlando di Lasso, Liszt, and Verdi. However, references to Polish Romantic poets Cyprian Kamil Norwid and Adam Mickiewicz have a special place in this work. They set the tone for the entire consideration and indicate the very personal genesis of the letter. It is undoubtedly the fruit of many years of reflection by the Polish Pope, who never fully abandoned his passion for artistic creation. After all, four years later, in 2003, he would still publish his final poem, Roman Roman Triptych. The passion of the document, in turn, is expressed in its final appeal. It is first a call addressed to all artists to rediscover the profound spiritual and religious dimension of art, which in every era has marked its most sublime works. For Christian artists, on the other hand, it is moreover a reminder that, a quote, the close alliance that has always existed between the gospel and art means that you are invited to use your creative intuition to enter into the heart of the mystery of the incarnate God and at the same time into the mystery of man, end quote, number 14. Thus formulated, the appeal is the point of arrival of the entire argument of the letter. I will return in a moment to the content of the letter's appeal to Christian artists. Before that, however, I would like to do my homework assigned to me by the Institute of Culture, which is to report on thinking together with John Paul II. What I would like to present in the second part will be organized into two reflections. John Paul II's interpretation of the place and role of the artist in society is based on a careful reading of scripture, as I tried to demonstrate earlier. However, evidently, it doesn't lack a cultural component or cultural conditioning, if you prefer. Reading many passages of the letter, we cannot help but recall the opinion often repeated by many commentators on John Paul II's pontificate, especially in Poland, that he was the last Polish romantic. Let's try to understand what this means, as it may make us uncomfortable, to some extent, in following the Pope's reflections. I will first try to help us understand why romanticism may cause us discomfort today, And later, I will help us understand a little better what John Paul II's romanticism actually was like. Hmm? What was the breakthrough in thinking about art and the role of the artist that the Romantic era brought? It will probably be easiest for me to explain it using an example from music, although, as we understand, any of the arts could be an illustration here. And probably I should mention that I'm stealing this example from Karl Popper's autobiography. Not many people remember that he wanted to become a, an orchestra conductor at the beginning of his career, and his 
uh, father-in-law was Bruno Walter, and his his wife was was a very very good pianist. Yeah. So because of that, you know, this kind of reflection started his his career, and he says that it was important also for his philosophical work. So let's think of the art of. Johann Sebastian Bach on the one hand, and the music of Ludwig van Beethoven on the other. I mentioned Beethoven here, still considered the last representative of classicism in music, because it is already in his work that the breakthrough I want to discuss was present. The former Bach is someone who seeks to express through his work what could be described as Harmonia Mundi, the harmony of the world. His music is meant to help us join the cosmic order of the universe offered to us by the Creator by giving voice to that order, one of many infinitely limited and meager if we compare it to the harmony itself. He considers himself a craftsman, a craftsman. The other, Beethoven, has the conviction that with his art, he should mainly express himself. It is in self-expression that the key to truly creative activity lies. Thus, he is not merely a craftsman rendering the harmony of the created world in front of him, but he becomes a creator, an artist, aware of his unique contribution to the understanding of the world and focused on putting it forward. The attitude of the latter will, of course, be taken up over time. After all, it correspondent, it correspond, co correspondent brilliantly with the transition from ancient and medieval theocentrism to the anthropocentrism of modern times. Significantly, the latter modern or romantic ideal will have a further history. The desire to express oneself as authentically as possible will find its expression in the search for articulated human identity in opposition to God in some parts of the romantic tradition. Take Goethe's Faust for example, it's a very good example of it. And over time will lead to the folly of seeking human identity in the transgressions of all existing order and harmony on the way to what would be authentic and true life, or in other words, in Friedrich Nietzsche's ideal of the Übermensch. Hmm? It's a very short <laughs> summary of, of a very complex process. Nevertheless, there is something like this behind. Taking all this into account, it might seem that if we want to look for a good model for guiding people who practice art to God, it would be much more adequate today to think about the vocation and role of the artist by returning to the pre-romantic, perhaps more modest, but also safer ideal of artistic work than to follow the romantic ideal which seems to have led us into the desert of increasingly shallow and showy transgressions. John Paul II, however, doesn't follow this path. If John Paul II doesn't follow that path, it is because his romanticism is the romanticism of Polish authors cited in the letter, Mickiewicz and Norwid, or the great absentee, I would say, who is perhaps most relevant to understanding the thinking of the Polish Pope, Zygmunt Krasiński. While still at school, Wojtyła played the part of a count in Krasiński's The Undivine Comedy on the stage of the Catholic House in Wadowice, and then also in the subsequent years of priesthood and episcopacy, reflections of the Polish romanticists and Rom romantics led by Krasiński's idea, uh, ideas regularly appeared in his work. 
Of course, this is not the place for a detailed presentation of the Polish Romanticism opposed to European Romanticism. For our purposes, it will suffice to emphasize that the Polish Romanticism, or at least its current that inspired Karol Wojtyła, was a complicated thing as well, was much more grounded in Catholicism than European Romanticism. Interested in expressing the extraordinary vocation of the artist, this version of Romanticism categorically emphasized the moral responsibility of the artist for his vocation and talent, and the key role of humility in the realization of artistic ideals. It is not so much the ideal of the Übermensch that will be the point of arrival of the Romanticism that inspired and enthralled Wojtyła, we don't expect it, but rather the ideal expressed in the life of the saint he admired so much, Albert, brother Albert Himelowski, who abandoned his work as a painter to dedicate, dedicate himself to a life of service to the poor of Krakow, and transforming his life into a piece of art. It is also important to keep in mind that not every European romanticism had the abil ability to interpret the fate of its national community as the fate of the suffering servant of Yahweh, that is to take national misfortunes as a sacrifice offered for the redemption of all other European nations the way Polish romanticism did. We must keep all this in mind to accurately interpret the romantic tone, certainly clearly present, of John Paul II's reflections in his letter to artists. Second point, place of beauty. The romantic tone of the reflections of the letter to artists corresponds, of course, with the platonic idea of kalokagatia, the idea of goodness beauty. This idea serves as a way of solving the basic problem of art of all times. It seems to make it possible to show convincingly the relation of beauty to goodness. This is, of course, a path that has been recognized for centuries and used by many. However, we would be remiss in not interpreting it without the light of the wisdom of St. Thomas, who, in my opinion, has something more to offer in this matter. As is, was, as, as is well known, St. Thomas didn't include beauty in his description of axiological transcendentals, transcendentalia. That is concept that we can apply to all beings without exception and which express their inherent value. Goodness and truth are there, but beauty is not. This sometimes causes embarrassment even to some Thomists. After all, we are accustomed to linking truth, goodness and beauty together and pronouncing them in the same breath. They seem to complement each other wonderfully and naturally. Could it be that here is no place for beauty in the Thomistic world? I had the great pleasure, and this is really the right word in this context, of listening to Professor Władysław Struzewski's metaphysics lectures during my studies in Krakow, together with Father Cesare. I remember that in his lecture on beauty, so I have a witness for that. I remember that in his lecture on beauty, and this was a subject to which he devoted considerable attention in his work, he told us that in Aquinas we would not find beauty as transcendentale because in his distinctions in this part of the Summa, everything was splendidly divided into two. Introducing a ternary div division at the last level would disturb the balance and harmony of the whole structure. This is precisely why he purportedly left beauty aside, according to Struzewski. And Struzewski therefore attempted to take concepts such as splendor, claritas, order, ordo, harmony, harmonia, 
and through a careful phenomenological analysis of them show that in the end, de facto, what we call beauty is also contained in the Thomistic interpretation thanks to splendor, order, and harmony of things noted by St. Thomas. Well, years later, I realized that this otherwise great Polish metaphysician had left me through these remarks of his an almost perfect illustration of the danger of using St. Thomas's philosophy without looking into the theological part of his work. For to any who tries to, to undertake a study of Aquinas's theology, it must quickly become clear that the absence of beauty among the transcendentalia has another reason. According to Aquinas and all classical Latin theology, there are two faculties of the soul with which two processions in God correspond. The procession according to the intellect, the word, and the procession according to the will, the Holy Spirit. These processions, in turn, find their economic articulation, it is to say, the articulation in salvation history, in the two missions of the divine persons that bring the presence of the divine persons to the believers. The presence of the word is given to us by the effects related to knowledge and its fruits expressed through the truth of things. The presence of the spirit, on the other hand, is given to us through the effects related to the will and the fruits of its action expressed by the goodness of things. Hmm? It is for this reason, and not for the sake of aesthetics in his distinctions, I think, that St. Thomas didn't include beauty in his list of axiological transcendentalia, and he is not an excep exceptional at this time. Truth and goodness correspond to the processions and missions of the divine persons, of which there are only two in God. However, Professor Struzewski was right in his attempts to find the transcendental place for beauty by referring to such concepts as claritas, ordo, or harmonia. But one may be inclined here, as some scholars will suggest, to go one step further than Struzewski's proposal. Perhaps beauty, perhaps beauty shouldn't be understood as a transcendentale, a concept that is interchangeable with being, which is an expression of the splendor, harmony, or order of things as such, so something like this. Beauty might be rather understood as a transcendentale that is the splendor, harmony, or order of goodness and truth. According to such an interpretation, beauty would be a transcendentale of a higher order, so to speak, or rather a hidden point of arrival, an expression of working together in harmony, an expression of the unity of the order of good and truth together. Why do I mention such an interpretation based on Aquinas' thought? Perhaps we cannot find it directly in Aquinas, but we can try to develop it like this. Isn't this Thomistic model in many ways more adequate for our attempts to describe the interrelation of beauty and goodness than the Platonic kalokagatia? Isn't it also, if I may put it that way, better pedagogically? If we follow such an interpretation, it turns out that true beauty can only be grasped when both truth and goodness are first in their place, so to speak, in our experience. Moreover, such an interpretation will lead us to the conclusion that in our action, which has the ambition to become the pursuit of beauty, we should be focused first on good and truth. And then beauty, as a glimmer of harmony, will be added, as it were, by the gift of grace. In our world, which is so affected not only by the fracture between good and beauty, but also by 
exposed truth, doesn't this interpretation turn out to be more accurate? Is it not more helpful? But let's turn to the letter to artists. I mentioned at the beginning that on the first reading, the papal enthusiasm for art and artists, which seems to abstract from the current state of contemporary art in many parts of the world, may feel uncomfortable. However, one would be wrong to think that John Paul II was uncritical of art and artists. He was certainly the Pope who spoke on the subject of art most often, and it is enough to look at his speeches from as far back as the early 1980s to realize that he was already well aware of the dark side of what was happening in artistic production. However, if the tone of the letter is so positive, warm, and lucid, it is, in my opinion, because he thought of the letter to artists as one of the important jubilee texts written to celebrate two millennia of Christianity's presence in the world. As is well known, such moments and pr are primarily intended to help rise above the current time to embrace what has happened, not just over the past decades, but two millennia, with a grateful glance and to inspire. This jubilee emphasis includes, could it be different, in the papal letter, also a succinct reference to the essence of John Paul II's pontificate program. I think we all remember it well. After all, it has been brought out many times and in various ways during the lectures of the Institute of Culture. Its essence can be, con its essence can be conveyed either by a phrase uttered at the Victory Square in Warsaw in 1979, so man cannot be understood without Christ, very well known, or by a phrase from the 22nd number of Gaudium et Spes, a passage of which will be found in the letter to artists, number 14. So you know this famous text, Gaudium et Spes 22, Christ, the final Adam, fully reveals man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear fully reveals man to man. If we begin to understand all this, we are also better able to see how central the role and vocation of the artist is for the Polish Pope. It is his art or her art that in a way is to help bring the conversation on man to conclusion. It is to say to the discovery that all our questions on the fullness of life find their ultimate answer in Christ. Quote, it is up to you, men and women, who have given your lives to art, to declare with all the wealth of your ingenuity that in Christ the world is redeemed. This succinct sentence is ultimately the most important message of the letter. In my opinion, this program has not become outdated one bit. However, it is worth seeing it against a somewhat broader background, worthy of the jubilee of 2,000 years of Christianity. The development of our reflection on God, the world, and the man in the West could be outlined as a transition from the theocentrism of the ancient and medieval eras to the anthropocentrism of the modern era, and further to the planetos planetocentrism of the postmodern era, which is now ours. Hmm? For the Christian, if such a development is not to be understood as a tragic regression and defeat, it must involve a sense of invitation to expand our hearts to embrace with our care and love an over-increasing range of reality. Understand? Only this way we can think about what, happened, or what is happening. Yeah? Only in this way can we find the right approach to the changes taking place. 
However, even if we view this development in such a way, how we experience and articulate the transition from ancient and medieval theocentrism to modern anthropocentrism still remains a critical moment for all of us. So, you know, this transition is of crucial importance because if we understand this transition in the right way, and it's the core of, of, of the project of John Paul II, yes, then we'll be able to understand how to, how to, how to say, find the right way in our times, so to say, Tra in this transition from anthropocentrism to planetocentrism. The program of John Paul II's pontificate was an invitation to all of us to understand and illuminate this critical moment as deeply as possible. The genius of the artist, on the other hand, was to play a central role in this program. Of course, this program has not been fully accomplished yet. It remains a task to be continued if we want to find our way in the postmodern era. Thank you. Father Michal, thank you very much for your interesting presentation. If there are any questions from the audience, it is possible to ask them now. Please use the microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Father Michal, for that well, wonderful lecture. Um, I, I would like to ask a question about post-truth, because uh, you skip it a little bit um, in the sense that you mentioned the post-truth era and the way how beauty has been seen before that and the relation between beauty and truth. So would you say that today, Nowadays, in our time of post-truth thing, we are also in an era of post-beauty in that, in that sense. Is it this kind of connection between truth and beauty? When we are in a post-truth era, we are also in a post-beauty times. Thank you. Well, I would say that I'm not uh, probably the best person here uh, in this room to answer uh, these kind of questions. I would expect some artists to, to have strong opinions about it. Uh, as, as you understand, well, my experience is that, that I, as, as someone who is a teacher of theology, I felt always obliged to visit all the modern art, you know, contemporary art gal galleries in the different uh, parts of the world when I, when, when I went, just to, 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 to have a look, you know, from the perspective of uh, someone who teaches theology at all that, or philosophy. And at some, at, at, uh, at some, some moment I remember in New York, I said to myself, Basta! Don't, 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 you know, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. Because, you know, after spending two or three hours in such a gallery, I, 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 I felt always so frustrated that, 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 you know, that in the end you have, it's, it's, it's a kind of industry today which has, which has very little to do with beauty, we, we, even with something which is meaningful. Sorry for saying it. It's, it's, it's an opinion of someone who is only a very simple consumer of such, such things. And I know that there, there, there are many real artists who, who struggle with the situation, who try to do 
uh, something better today, and, and I, I really, uh, how to say, pay homage to all of them right now, yes. But, but at the same time, my, uh, uh, my um, uh, experience of, 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 of some, some, some simple, how to say, consumer, it's not the best uh, receiver, how to say, uh, of art is, is like this. I think that it's a little bit better in the area of music. I don't know why, but... But 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 uh, uh, that, that, that music is not lost in, in 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 the same way. So so contemporary music, I, I would I would be able you know to quote any artist to whom I have um, I have more um, uh, more reverence. But but I have to say uh, I'm speaking about you know this mainstream mainstream art supported by big uh, institutions and so on and and. Obviously, there are many artists struggling to, to, to survive uh, out of uh, mainstream, but, but quite often their, their lives are not, not very easy. So, so Thank you very much, uh, brother. Uh, I, I liked very much your presentation and particularly the focus that you put in the importance to uh, understand the shift uh, from uh, uh, theocentrism to anthropocentrism. And in fact, this is the, the big shift. Uh, there is a, uh, a not well-known philosopher and theologian that is Tomato Tommaso de Maria, I, that was a, a Salesian who died in 1996, who studied the historical reality using developing the um, realistic categories. And he explains metaphysically this passage. So I'm not going to, uh, to explain, but it's a cultural shift, a passage that is uh, produced by the Industrial Revolution that dynamized the historical reality, ontologically speaking, and that produced progressively a passage from a static sacral society where religion was uh, like the direct soul of the society during what he calls uh, humanist interludes that started with humanism and ended with, uh, uh, let's say, the Industrial Revolution, uh, we passed it to a dynamic and secularized society. And uh, the cultural matrix uh, shifted from being religion, the foundation of values and of knowledge. Now knowledge is at the first uh, place and knowledge gives the values of the culture and even the religion, if there is, um, I mean, still a place for the religion. So the way to, uh, to address the, the culture nowadays is not directly with religion, but through what he calls an ideopraxis, that is an ideology uh, rationalized into a praxis. And of course, there is a uh, metaphysical foundation, but uh, indeed, this is the, the main point. If we understand, I do agree, if we understand what happened and why, then we can finally have a, a major role to play as church uh, for the culture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this comment. I think that, that, that as, as you understand, we are speaking about very complex processes, so and, and so it's very difficult to say that there is only one factor which is which is decisive. So this shift from theocentrism to anthropocentrism, it's not something which 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 was done and and the, the next shift as well, uh, because of of some bad will of of, of, of one bad man who, who just wanted uh, us to push us in this direction. It's much more complex. And, and, and I, I fully agree that, that, that the church being able to, how to say, to uh, translating it in a, in a much more, in a, in a simpler image. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, the church uh, inviting us to combine our intellect with our heart in, uh, you know, in, our, in our operation, 
in, a, in our action, uh, has here some receipt how to, how to overcome uh, the place we are uh, in, in, in the contemporary world today. Nevertheless, you know, I think that, that, that we have, especially in the western part of the world, be, uh, <laughs> be prepared to, to become a, 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 a counter-cultural institution, yeah? and, uh, first of all, and, and not, you know, have a, a big influence on, 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 on the mainstream. Yeah? But, but it's, it's the gospel as well. So. so thank you very much. I am now pleased to introduce our second speaker, Professor Remy Brack who will join us via internet connections. Professor Brack is a professor emeritus of philosophy at the Sorbonne University in Paris and former Romano Guardini Chair of Philosophy at the Ludwig Maximilian University at München. Since 2021, he has been also giving courses for the student of the Angelicum. Professor Brack is a renowned scholar of classical and medieval philosophy culture and philosophy of religion. His publications include Europe, the Roman Road, the Wisdom of the World, the Human Experience of the Universe in Western Thought, the Law of God, the Philosophical History of an Idea, and the Kingdom of Man, Genesis and Failure of the Modern Project. Professor Brack is not only a renowned lecturer and author, but also a recipient of numerous awards. In 2009, he received the Joseph Pieper Prize and the Grand Prix de Philosophie from the French Academy. And in 2012, he was announced a Ratzinger Prize winner. Today, Professor Brack will enrich our conference with a talk about the meaning of beauty. Professor Brack, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, you can wonder my you can mind my beautiful mug on the screen. Can you? Yes. I'm afraid I am afraid I can't see you, but it's can not you Yes, you? you can. Okay, well I'm so sorry, you know, I'm facing but I'm facing a bevy of technical problems. Uh, I'm afraid I'll have to read my, uh, the text of my lecture from the screen of another computer. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and for your nice words of presentation. Well, okay. Uh, perhaps I could put this somewhere. Okay, that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid I couldn't do better. Well, if you can see my library, that's better. <laughs> the library is more important than the mug of the fellow who is supposed to read them. So, Professor, well, we, 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 we hear you very perfectly well and, and see you also. So, okay. so, thank you very much. Well, seeing is optional, listening to is important. <laughs> well, why should we be interested in the beauty? Not only to enjoy it, which we undoubtedly do when we contemplate a landscape or a flower, or when we visit an exhibition in a museum, listen to a concert, read a poem, watch a movie or a TV series, etc. But as the topic of philosophical meditation, and for that matter, of an academic lecture course, why couldn't we leave the beautiful alone? It will shift for itself anyway. Be that as it may, leaving the beautiful alone, this is precisely but the, well, the philosophical tradition hardly ever did. It never thought it alone and always brought the beautiful in contact, in dialogue with other ideas. The beautiful was part and parcel of a complex structure 
which some sort of system of sorts, the elements of which were articulated on each other and interacted with each other. By the way, I may have mentioned philosophical tradition a bit too quickly, but this was the case even before philosophy arose as a separate undertaking. In pre-philosophical experience, the beautiful was hardly independent of other qualities. The state of affairs left its trace in the language. In the two sources of our Western culture, which are symbolically named after the two paradigmatic cities, Athens and Jerusalem, the adjective, which we translate as beautiful, had a rather vague meaning, which included the good, and had at least a smack of the true. The Greek kalos seldom means only beautiful, but it means excellent as well. And when the Hebrew Bible, in the first account of creation at the beginning of Genesis, says that God found the world he had just called into existence, tov me'od, this may mean very good, but very beautiful at the same time. This is the satisfaction of a painter which, who steps back from his easel and finds it a success. In our modern languages, we have kept inklings of such a proximity between the beautiful and other positive qualities of things. Let us think of the English use of the adjective fair. We admire the fair sex, but we hope we will get a fair trial, even of Justice Smith, Jones, or Brown, uh, even if those people are not exactly Adonises. We can mention, too, the French beau geste, which entered English parlance on the basis of a novel, then of a movie. The phrase doesn't mean a gracious gesture, but an act of magnanimity. Full-fledged philosophy, this technical discipline, which arose in ancient Greece with the so-called pre-Socratics, and found a first bloom with Plato and his disciple Aristotle, full-fledged philosophy endeavored to untangle this vague skein of notions. It didn't simply leave it aside. Rather, it replaced it with the articulated structure which I alluded to a while ago. This structure found its rigorously technical expression in the medieval concept of the so-called transcendental properties of being. As is well known, the first treatise on the transcendentals was the work of Philip the Chancellor, who died in 1236 in his Summa de Bono. Those transcendental properties are being itself, the one, the true, the good, they are called that way because they are to be found in each and every category, so that they sort of transcend the boundaries which separate them. To take up an example which is already in Aristotle, the good is present in the category of substance as God. In the category of quality, Um, sorry, I had a problem with my cell phone. <laughs> uh, now, the beautiful was considered as having something to do with those transcendental properties of being. I will qualify this presently. Now, it is the case that today the transcendentals are in some sort of crisis. All of them are in the same predicament. They all feel the flack. All of them have been jeered at, or more mildly poked fun at, 
for some decades already. The one, the one is dangerous because it reduces the pleasantly colorful diversity of things by crushing its spectrum into a dull gray. Monotheism, for instance, is not so much dangerous because of the number of deities, one or several, but rather because of the introduction into religion of the notion of truth, which brings about that other religions are supposed to be false, misleading, worship of false deities, i.e. mere idolatry. I am summarizing here the thesis of the uh, recently deceased German Egyptologist Jan Asman. Truth is suspicious. It, truth is tolerated with quotation marks only. It is said to foster intolerance, claiming to possess truth, which nobody does, but many people are taunted with doing precisely that. Claiming to possess truth is a token of arrogance and perhaps even the worst crime. Some phrases became common parlance in the everyday public discourse, which all give evidence of a soft peddling of truth. Memoirs or autobiographies receive the prudent title of my part of truth. In discussions on the media, we hear, well, this is your truth, but there is my truth too. And President Trump spoke of alternative truths. Goodness, goodness is either trumped up or when it is real, inefficient. In politics, there is no such thing as a common good of a body politic. There is only my good, but to cruise to the interest of my social class, my race, my trade union, and so on. I shall have to defend it by fighting rival goods. At the level of the individual, good is more often than not rather derogatory, implying naivety, hypocrisy, uptightness, and so on. Why should we try and salvage the transcendentals? If they are so dangerous, perhaps it would be apposite to wish them goodbye and think good riddance. My answer is the transcendentals are per definitionem properties of being. Now being itself is at stake, not as a vague, vaporous philosophical concept, but in a plain, modest meaning. The very being of humankind its existence on our planet is at stake. I am not alluding only to problems of environment, but to the problem of the demographic collapse of our societies, which is rather hushed up than frankly asked. What would really be clear and present danger would be to take this issue lightly. Retrieving being and retrieving the transcendentals may be two sides of the same coin. Our task may be to retrieve the transcendentals in their focal identity and their articulation on each other. I said, reminding you of medieval discussion that the beautiful had something to do with the transcendental properties of being. I chose this rather vague formula in order not to avoid the issue of the legitimacy of its belonging to the club of its sitting among other members on a comfortable armchair. As is well known, scholastic authors didn't agree on the topic. Some admitted the beautiful as a transcendental on the same level as the other four. This is the case in a short treatise ascribed to Bonaventura and later in Jean Gerson. Other ones, among whom Aquinas has pride of place, prefer to consider it beautiful as subordinate to the true or to the good as their splendor. The beautiful is in any case the last of the transcendentals, 
the most precarious, the one which sits on a folding seat. Now, there is some sort of rule in God's doings expressed in the Magnificat, the posuit potentes de sede et exaltavit humiles. For instance, the elder son is vanquished by the younger one. Jacob beats Esau. Joseph, the last of the twelve, saves them from starving to death, and so on. The paradox comes to a head with a so-called kenosis, Christ emptying himself of the rank which made him equal to God. Now my hunch is that the, this biblical law obtains in the case of the transcendentals too. The last one, beauty, will help the other ones and salvage them. Beginning with the beautiful doesn't amount to leaving the other ones in the lurch, drowning in Augustine's regio de similitudinis. On the contrary, it may be a way for us to throw them a boy. In the present world, in the same way as the universally acknowledged transcendentals, the beautiful is in danger. Now, there is a paradox which deserves pointing out. The beautiful is perfectly safe where it arises spontaneously as a landscape, a flower, a sunset, etc. Strangely, the place in which the beautiful is the most menaced is the very human activity in which it should flourish, i.e. the arts. We used to speak of the fine arts as being the different ways by which beauty comes to the fore. Hegel, the German philosopher, even places beauty produced by art higher than natural beauty. Natural beauty simply happens. Beauty in art is the result of a conscious will. Hence, it is a product of the mind, which is immensely superior to whatever is natural. The foulest thought of the worst scoundrel is more worth than the sun. As for the stars, which elicit ecstasy in poetical minds, they are spots. The German poet Heinrich Heine told uh, uh, an encounter with Hegel in a party in Berlin, where the philosopher lectured at the university. The poet, Heine, was lost in the contemplation of the starry sky. Hegel came, cleared his throat with a hoof, and said, the stars are pimples on the heavenly skin. As for art, a momentous shift took place at the end of the 18th century. Natural beauty was demoted to make place for human creative activity. But the latter had little time to celebrate its triumph, for beauty in art quickly followed suit. The place where this began to happen was the German town of Jena, whose university was dominated by the powerful philosopher Fichte. A group of young intellectuals, philosophers, theologians, poets, and influential ladies launched what was later known under the moniker of early German Romanticism. In this framework, young Friedrich Schlegel wrote in 1796 a longish essay on the study of Greek poetry. As a matter of fact, despite the title, he focused on a comparison between ancient and modern literature. He meant thereby, he meant by modern, but we would rather call medieval an early modern literature. As examples, he mentions writers like the novelist Cervantes and the playwright Shakespeare. He makes there, in this essay, 
an ominous statement by pointing out that this modern literature doesn't aim at the beautiful, but at what he called the interesting. The interesting encompasses a broad spectrum of notions. Whatever tickles our taste is interesting. Some of those notions are rather on the ugly side, the grotesque, the burlesque, caricature, and so on. Sorry. Ah. said no. Some of those notions are rather on the ugly side, as I told you, and this was meant by Schlegel, uh, this uh, a privilege given to interesting over the beautiful, was meant by Schlegel as hardly more than an observation, as the cool account of a matter of fact. There was since the beginning of artistic activity an endeavor to broaden the scope of art in order to encompass the ugly together with the beautiful. In the Iliad, in Homer's Iliad, we have the description of fair cities, the ugliest of all Greeks. In Greek comedy, we have ugly and vulgar characters like the sausage seller in Aristophanes' Horsemen. In modern literature, what was earlier considered as ugly was rehabilitated. What was tolerated in the margins and in the lower level of style, in comedy, style or caricature, invaded the very core and pinnacle of artistic pursuits. The French poet and playwright Victor Hugo saw in the preface he wrote for his play Cromwell, he saw in the grotesque the central object of drama. A more momentous step was taken on the level of transcendentals. The beautiful was severed from two other transcendentals, namely the true and the good. Let us first consider the true. Separating the beautiful from the true leads to conceiving art as illusion. To be sure, ancient artists never thought of art as being true. The genre known as still life painting strove to the most faithful reproduction of reality, but it never claimed that the venison, the oysters, the half-peeled orange and so on, were real. The apple in the painting was not a real apple, but it was supposed to express a deeper truth, the idea of it. It was supposed to tell us more on what an apple is all about than the fruit we pluck from the tree, peel, and eat in a pie. Plotinus, the Greek philosopher Plotinus, furnished painters with a conceptual tool which enabled them to parry Plato's attack on representative art, which, so Book 10 of the Republic, allegedly boils down to copying material things, i.e. what is itself a copy of true reality. Plotinus put forward that the artists went higher than reality and copied not the things, but the very idea of them. Phidias, the well-known Greek sculptor, did not copy Zeus. He would have been in a pretty pickle if he had to do that, by the way. He sculpted Zeus such as he would look like if he happened to reveal himself to us. So Plotinus. By the way, why the heck should we prefer truth and give it a higher rank than illusion? The question is asked implicitly in a fam famous piece 
written in 1830 by the Russian poet Pushkin. There was the legend on Bonaparte, not yet the Napoleon he was to become after his coronation as emperor of the French. There was this legend on Bonaparte in Egypt. He is said to have visited the, the soldiers who had contracted best. This was an example of courage. Now, he turned out to have tried to ascertain who was still able to fight and didn't care a fig about the well-being of the soldiers. A historian had ascertained that and exposed the legend. Pushkin reacted and answered that he would despise real historical fact and prefer an illusion, the Russian is Abman, which lifts up upwards. Giving the truth a higher value than illusion is, according to Nietzsche, a Platonic and Christian prejudice. I said Platonic and Christian. I should have said Christian, hence Platonic, for you remember that for Nietzsche, Christianity is hardly more than a, quote, Platonism for the vulgar. The German philosopher wanted to do away with this Platonic and Christian ranking, placing the true higher than the false. As for us, we can easily turn the tables and observe that science and the whole system of culture has as their deepest underpinnings biblical faith. For the modern artist, Illusion is left alone, without any reference to a deeper or higher layer of truth underlying humdrum reality of everyday life or overarching it. Illusion is not only the unavoidable result of artistic activity, but its whole point, its aim. Now, some words on the good. The modern worldview, in the wake of Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and later Darwin, led to reduce reality to the struggle of blind forces against each other. Big fish eat smaller ones. Big heavenly bodies draw smaller ones to them. Reality is morally neutral and even evil. Our striving towards the good, our human striving towards the good, has no equivalent, let alone a helpful prop in outer reality. Art, as producing beautiful works, has not only nothing to do with truth, its function is even to stave off reality, to build a fence around it. And on this point, too, art is in keeping with human activity at large. According to the modern worldview, this human activity, generally meaning, consists in building an island of sense, or rather, a raft floating on an ocean of meaninglessness. For the Italian poet Leopardi, Truth is ugly. Hence, the poet should sort of live in a hermetically closed apartment furnished with beautiful pieces. And for this, Leopardi has, has a favorite metaphor, the boa, in Italian, siepe. The boa, which shuts our sight off the frightful infinity. Nietzsche said all that in a nutshell, quote, beauty is false, truth is ugly. We have art so that we don't perish on truth. Now, a still deeper irony is at work here. Once the true and the good are severed from the beautiful, the beautiful itself becomes superfluous and can be done away with. 
And this is exactly what happened in modern art. The corresponding theory replaces the beautiful with notions of all ilk. What was in Schlegel a value-free observation, the beautiful being replaced by the interesting, became a program. What was the case in the practice of art was mirrored in art theory, art theory which could do without the beautiful. The most revealing example may be Heidegger. Martin Heidegger delivered in 1935 a lecture which was later printed as an essay on the work of art. The title is The Origin of the Work of Art. In the written version, the adjective beautiful occurs only once. And what is more, in the oral lecture, which was the first he delivered, and the text of which has become known ever since, the word simply didn't occur. A meditation on the work of art without the word beautiful. And beauty, in the, written, in the last written version, last printed version, is dealt with squarely only in the post-face. Now, beauty was not only replaced by other concepts which belonged to a lower level of experience, like uh, interesting, grotesque, burlesque, and so on. A powerful rival sprang out of beauty itself at the same level as some sort of feuding brother. And this concept arose approximately around the watershed of the last 20 years of the 17th century, a time which a French historian of ideas, Paul Hazard, called the crisis of European consciousness in a book by this title written in 1935. This concept was the sublime, the sublime. Up to now, up to this point of time, the word which translated the Greek substantive hypsos, i.e. greatness, highness, referred, this word referred to a level of style, the highest, the loftiest kind of writing. It had been first thematized by the anonymous author who in the late first century penned a treatise which was ascribed to Denis Longinus, a more famous scholar. The text gained vast popularity thanks to the French translation made in 1674 by the French poet and literary critic Nicolas Boileau. Boileau became a staunch supporter of the ancients in the famous controversy known as the quarrel of ancients and moderns, which took place some 13 years later. But here, in his translation, he unwittingly acted as the harbinger of a powerful upheaval in the experience which we call aesthetic. This is a word, by the way, which will require analysis. But this is another story. I hope to be able to tell the story later. Before the end of the 17th century, the sublime was a way for writers to express things in high-flown style. Now, somewhere during the early 18th century, the sublime began to refer to the things themselves. To be sure, there were things the description of which could hardly be made in another style than precisely the sublime one. And indeed, say a tempest, an earthquake, uh, the infinity of time and space, all those themes exclude any possible comic treatment and require a serious description. The distinction between the beautiful and the sublime was first powerfully orchestrated by Edmund Burke, 
in his essay of 1752. Burke distinguishes the pleasure produced by the beautiful and the special reaction elicited by the sublime in the reader or onlooker, a reaction which he calls delight. He distinguishes pleasure and delight. For him, delight is a blend of satisfaction and uneasiness, a blend of pleasure and pain. And one generation later, the sublime received a deep philosophical analysis in Kant's third critique of 1791. Introducing the sublime on the, on the stage had several consequences. Let me here mention only one, which has a direct bearing on beauty itself. Plato, in the Phaedrus, had described in powerful terms the effect of beauty on the soul of human beings. Half a millennium later, his remote disciple Plotinus, whom I read already mentioned, developed the same idea. Beauty reminds people of another world, of a superior layer of being, of the intelligible world of the ideas. Beauty tears them apart from the humdrum world of everyday life. And the sensation produced is some sort of awe, nay, of sacred terror, that the Greek captures by the word thambos. Now, this is very much where the sublime, such as it is described by Burke and Kant, is supposed to rouse in us. Those affects were transposed from the beautiful to the sublime, which sort of drew to itself whatever was disturbing in the experience of beauty. Consequently, beauty was bereft of its disturbing dimension and left as a harmless object of enjoyment. Beauty had sort of lost its sting. Beauty was ready, to put it with Heidegger, to enter the field of competence of a confectioner. A work of art, provided it was meant to be a thing of beauty, was hardly more than a dignified sugar plum. So far so good. But what shall we do? What is our task? Well, this is a tall order. Just two hints. First, let me point out that the experience of beauty, such as it was described by Plato and later on by Plotinus, is still possible. And well, the best way for us to show that something is possible is to show that it is real. Some late writers kept an inkling of what beauty is all about. And as a witness, let me call the Austrian poet Rilke, Rainer Maria Rilke, who died in 1926, if I remember, if my memory serves me right. In the first of his Duino elegies, Duino is the name of a castle in Istria, in the uh, well, northern part of uh, Dalmatia in present-day Croatia. In the first of his Duino elegies, written in 1912, we read, right at the beginning, beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror, which we are barely able to endure, 
and are awed because it serenely disdains to annihilate us. I repeat, well, that's a translation I found on internet. Uh, beauty, uh, beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror. The beginning of terror which we are barely able to endure and we are awed because it serenely disdains to annihilate us. Now, we saw that the modern worldview in the wake of early German romanticism reduces the artistic activity to the production not of beautiful objects, but of interesting objects. This should be countered, and this is my second point, the second hint I promised, this should be countered, but not by endeavoring to get back to a beautiful which would be free of any element of interest. On the contrary, a possible way out would consist in borrowing deeper in the notion of interesting. I suggested elsewhere that we should distinguish three kinds of interest. The rewarding, the fascinating, and the interesting, properly speaking. And what we commonly mean by interesting is, in fact, only the fascinating, what catches us and invites us to rest in contemplation. Whereas what I call interesting, properly speaking, is something in which we are sort of part and parcel of the whole reality, inter esse. That's what the word, that's the, what the Latin verb tells us. Interesting is what does not only fascinates us, well, a, uh, a thriller uh, or a good movie or a good TV series can fascinate us, can fasten us. We have to keep uh, listening and watching. But this won't tell us anything about ourselves. We won't be in. After once the movie is over, once the TV set is turned off, okay, we are exactly the same as before. On the contrary, what is really interesting, interesting in the fullest meaning of the word, changes us, changes us. We are not the same after uh, say, uh, uh, watching uh, uh, Oedi Oedipus, Oedipus Rex. We are the same after, well, I'm a great lover of P.G. Woodhouse. And well, after uh, uh, a novel by Woodhouse, well, I, I had a good laugh, but I'm exactly the same as before. If I read seriously and thoroughly a great masterpiece of literature, say a play by Shakespeare or uh, uh, Don Quixote, I mentioned Cervantes before, I must ask, am I not somewhere, in some way, am I not Hamlet? Am I not Don Quixote? Am I not Faust? Those masterpieces are interesting because they draw me in. Well, Let me take my bearings as a conclusion from the medieval characterization of the beautiful as, to quote a well-known medieval formula, splendor weary, the splendor of the true. But one may first ask how a truth without splendor would look like. Would such a truth be simply interesting? Would, this, would such a truth, a, a truth without lustre, would it draw the attention of the onlookers? Now it is the case that we live, right now, we live among such truths. Scientific truth is not interesting. Well, this is 
scandalous, but I assume. By science, I mean every kind of knowledge, not only physics, astronomy, biology, what not. I mean historical or literary knowledge too. And I claim that any knowledge is not interesting. No knowledge is interesting. Science, natural science, physics, is immensely rewarding. It was the first meaning of interesting, according to the distinction I suggested. Science is immensely rewarding, thanks to the technology which it makes possible. Science can be immensely fascinating, too when it reveals to us the unfathomable immensity of the universe, of the incredible complexity of life. But science doesn't answer the questions we would like to ask. By this token, science could be defined not without a spot of humor, not without a grain of salt, as the set of answers to questions which we don't ask because they don't make any difference in our life and consequently questions about the answers to which we don't give it on. Well, if, beautiful, if the beautiful is the splendor of the true, well, for the most part, we take for granted the splendor which is said to irradiate from the beautiful. Now, we should try to sort of shed light on this splendor and ask what kind of splendor is there at work? My claim would be the splendor of truth is what Augustine, Saint Augustine, called veritas redargvens, too. Well, the concept is to be found in Book 10 of the Confessions. This is a passage in Augustine around which I constantly move. He there distinguishes two kinds of the truth, a truth with which sheds light on things and which enables us to know them, to know them and to master them, to use them as we want, on the one hand. But he conceives at the same time, alongside with the veritas lucens, to quote him, another kind of truth, another kind of light, for red arguens means too, there is something uh, uh, lightful in there, red arguere, arguere, the, the same root as argentum, yeah? uh, the, the, the metal which shines. In this uh, splendor, there is a light which strikes back on us, red arguere, a light which strikes back on us, which probes the depths of our soul even in its most hidden recesses, i.e. the recesses we would like to keep concealed. Such a light, such a truth, invites us to some sort of conversion. Splendor, splendor, can be dazzling. Splendor can invite us to change our life in the direction of goodness. Let me quote, and those will be my last words, let me quote once again the poet Rilke. There is a poem in which he explains that he is looking at 
a fragment of a Greek statue, a statue of the god Apollo, who has lost his head and half uh, uh, his, his arms, if I remember well, half of his limb, of his legs. And even in this bad state, the statue is so appealing, so provocative, that the poet suddenly realizes that he is not only looking at the statue, but that the statue is looking at him rather than the other way only. And he's, he ends his poem by the line, here is no place which doesn't look at you. You must change your life. And this is uh, a, an instance of the way in which the beautiful is still able uh, to uh, lead us towards the truth on ourselves and the good which we have to possibly to reach. Thank you so much for your attention. Professor Brack, thank you very much for your exquisite lecture. It is now possible to present a couple of questions from our audience. Go ahead. Um, Dostoevsky in the Karamazov Brothers say that the beauty will save the world. Yes, but uh, for you, Professor, what is that beauty? Maybe the splendor of the truth. Uh, what beauty? Well, first of all, let me correct your statement. Dostoevsky never said that. A character in Dostoevsky said that. And the character does not belong among the characters of the uh, brothers Karamazov. The character who is uh, putting forward such an utterance is a character in the idiot, in the idiot uh, which uh, antedates uh, the brothers Karamazov. Uh, wait a minute, brothers Karamazov were published in 1880. Uh, the idiot uh, must have been around uh, 60, in the, in the late 50s or early 60s, if my memory serves me right. You'll have to check that. And well, in the idiot, there is a character by the name of Hippolyte. And this is a young student, uh, rather nihilistic in his worldview, Uh, Prince uh, Mishkin, uh, who is the main character uh, in the novel. And he says, uh, uh, you were said to have, uh, you were reported, Prince, to have said that beauty will save the world. Okay. Then the utterance, beauty will save the world, mir spasiot krasata, is not an utterance by Dostoevsky, not even an utterance by the main character of the novel, but an utterance which is ascribed, allegedly ascribed, uh, to uh, this main character by a, uh, well, uh, well, let's say, uh, secondary, secondary character uh, in the thing, uh, in the novel. Okay. And as far, uh, and well, uh, let me observe that the prince, uh, for, well, first of all, th this young fellow who uh, says that the prince uh, might have said that and so on, uh, this young fellow, uh, uh, well, does not receive, uh, uh, yeah, first, interprets the utterance he ascribes to the prince to his being in love. Okay. And being in love, well, as the proverb has it, loves Love makes blind. Okay. And the prince doesn't answer a bare word. So we don't know whether he, uh, well, endorses uh, this uh, uh, rather strong or heavy thesis or whether uh, that's simply an idea that came through uh, um, uh, uh, Hippolyte's uh, mind. On the other hand, 
On the other hand, there is an article by Dostoevsky, a short essay, which he wrote uh, as an answer to a young art critique who died very young, 25, by the name of Dobrolyubov. And Dobrolyubov, well, supported uh, the uh, thesis according to which art has to be useful. Art has to uh, uh, endeavor to be as useful as a pair of boots. And uh, Dostoevsky, in this context, puts forward this thesis that uh, uh, art and beauty are exactly as necessary uh, for us than eating and drinking. But the, 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 the conceptuality of salvation, you know, beauty will save the world, beauty will salvage or rescue or whatnot the world, this is not in Dostoevsky. So then let's be prudent. Well, what I, then to come back to uh, the last part of your question, uh, how would I uh, define beauty? Well, there is a, a, a there are answers uh, in the philosophical tradition, and my own uh, personal experience of beauty. Uh, well, it's very much in keeping with the description that Plato gave of it, i.e. something that reminds us of something better, uh, something higher, uh, something worthier than the world, the world of our everyday experience. And for this reason, well, I would condone <laughs> the doctrine according to which I express myself in quite a prudent way, according to which beauty has something to do with the good and with the true, and of course, with being. Okay, well, uh, I'm waiting for more. Okay. Um, uh I have two questions. Um, the first uh, one concerns this category of the, the sublime, which you, Professor, have used. Uh, do you see any similarities between this category and the phenomenon uh, of um, experiencing the divine, which was described uh, by Rudolf Otto as a combining as the combination of Mysterium Fascinans and uh, Mysterium Tremendum. Uh, so that's the first one. The second one uh, is about Heidegger. And do, do you see uh, any possibilities uh, within the thought of uh, Heidegger of the rehabilitation of this uh, idea of beauty? I think of this many places in Sein und Zeit uh, when uh, he uses this metaphorical uh, set of, um, uh, of imaginations um, connected with Veritatis uh, Lucens. Uh, but mainly I have in mind this, this uh, thought of him when he says that his effort is not to think the being, is to let the being uh, think ourselves or um, our own being. And in this context, for me, is, uh, there's a um, very important, uh, I think the very important notion in this context is his notion of uh, Gelassenheit, uh, which he uses in his later uh, works, which is derived from uh, Master Eckhart, and which is translated by John Caputo as letting be. So, uh, I find this effort of Heidegger as an um, effort of letting be, of letting the, the being to reveal uh, itself to us by, 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 it own, but by its own, by, yeah. Uh, so that's my um, questions, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Well, two pretty interesting questions. I will try to answer them as best as I can. Now I'm sure to be able to, uh, uh, well, give you a satisfactory answer. Well, as far as the first question is concerned, i.e. about the relationship between the concept of the sublime 
and uh, Rudolf Otto's well, system of uh, concept uh, meant to capture the experience of the sacred, you know, um, I would say sacred rather, well, according to his own terms, rather than religious, you know, uh, well, let's say, uh, uh, yes, sacred is perhaps a more neutral concept than religious or things like that. And certainly not the holy. Uh, uh, the holy is a biblical concept and the sacred is rather on the pagan side of the human experience, although I use here the adjective pagan without any derogatory shade of meaning, for it is a great deal of uh, uh, the pagan experience that were taken up and well, purified and so on by a biblical uh, experience and later on by Christianity. Well, uh, what is interesting in uh, uh, Otto's concept of the sacred is its ambivalence, you know, it's, uh, it is at the same time uh, something that uh, draws us, uh, that, that charms us, and at the same time something that we are not allowed to touch because there is something dangerous in it, you know. And by the way, this, is, this resembles very much what uh, Rilke, in the poem I first quote, in the first of the two poems which I quoted, I mean the, the, Duino, the first Duino L.J., uh, when he says that the beautiful uh, could, well, well, the beautiful is this aspect of the terrible, Terrible or terrific? <laughs> Here the uh, uh, English enables us to pun in quite a significant way. Um, the beautiful is what could destroy us, okay. and it is dangerous, but includes an element of, uh, let's say, mercy. Mercy, it does not, it chooses sort of not to uh, destroy us. And by the way, it's interesting to observe that the German word, which I translated, or which the uh, translated, uh, the translation I chose, I, I found on internet. Uh, um, okay, uh, uh, the, the, the English says, it serenely disdains to annihilate us. Yeah? And the German is, uh, is, uh, Gelassen verschmäht uns zu zerstören. The gelassen, and here have, uh, we, we have here the, the gelassenheit, uh, which you uh, were alluding to. Well, then about Heidegger. Uh, it might, by the way, it might be the case that Heidegger read some Rudolf Otto, the work of Rudolf Otto, das Heilige, which was published um, right before the first war. Uh, um, broke out, um, was quite popular, you know, it was rather in, it was uh, uh, fashionable to, to read it, and he might have read it. Uh, I, I'll have to check that in the lecture course he gave in the, in the, in the early 20s about uh, the phenomenology of religion. And well, uh, there is in Heidegger, I, I don't, I'm afraid I don't remember I don't have present in my mind the passages from Sein and Zeit, uh, which you were alluding to. Um, well, you, you are sure to be right, but uh, okay, I'll have to uh, um, re-read this uh, uh, once more. Uh, the trouble with Heidegger is that, as far as uh, the idea of beauty is concerned, that he, uh, well, let's say, in my opinion, uh, seldom faces uh, the concept uh, as such. Uh, the, 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 more the most interesting passage I know of in the published work, not in the lecture courses, uh, is uh, a passage in the, in the introduction to metaphysics. And it was originally a lecture course given in uh, 35 or something like that. And it was later published, it was published in 53, so many years after that, almost 20 years later. And well, there's a passage in which, from which I borrowed uh, the uh, uh, phrase I used when I said that 
uh, beauty uh, could become, uh, could enter the uh, field of a confectioner. Uh, this is a quip, a quip uh, made, made by Heidegger himself uh, in order to uh, criticize the reduction of the experience of beauty to aesthetics. This is, by the way, an element which I should have broached uh, if I had more time at my disposal in my, uh, in my lecture. The very fact that we speak of the beautiful as being an aesthetic concept presupposes that the, uh, the, the place of this experience is the subjectivity of uh, well, of the subject, sorry for the repetition, uh, human subjectivity. Uh, whereas the experience of the beautiful, such as it is sketched, uh, at least uh, in uh, Plato's Phaedrus, is rather uh, the experience of the subject being, uh, well, torn out of him or herself you know, and brought over to another dimension of reality. Whereas, as soon as you use the word aesthetics, you put the experience of uh, uh, the beautiful on the same level, on the same footing as the sensory experience, uh, just uh, uh, seeing, uh, hearing, uh, tasting, and whatnot, and nothing more. So, uh, the, the main point I would uh, uh, like to bring to the fore uh, is the way in which the beautiful well, has a dimension of ecstasy. The, the word is uh, in Plotinus, you know, uh, being uh, drawn out of oneself. And without such an experience, well, uh, the beautiful uh, well, is on the same level as an apple pie or as a, uh, something delicious uh, for, for, the, for the taste and something which uh, does not uh, uh, tell us anything about what we are and what we should be, i.e. without any moral dimension, without any connection uh, between the beautiful and the good, which is what we should endeavor to restore. Professor Brack, thank you very much once again for your presence with us by internet. And now I would like to invite our audience for a short 15 minutes break. After the break, we continue with the panel discussion. Thank you so much. My
Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce to you my, Michał Kwasowski, who will be moderating the panel discussion that is ahead of us. Michał, Mr. Kwasowski is a journalist and a Vatican specialist, director of the analysis of and development department of the Institute of New Media and editor of the Polish Wszystko Co Najważniejsze magazine. He is graduated of the JP2 studies at the Angelicum and is currently preparing his doctorate dissertation at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. Michał, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, well, it's a great joy and honor to be able to sit at this table. Uh, and on this side of Ola, as a former student of JP2 Institute of Culture, uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to host this, uh, this panel discussion this evening. And it's also even greatest uh, honor to welcome our panelists this evening. Obviously, I um, would like to introduce um, His Eminence Cardinal Grzegorz Rysz uh, to our discussion. His Eminence is the Archbishop of Łódź, Poland, and he studied at the Faculty of Theology and Faculty of Church History of the Pontifical Academy of Theology of Krakow and in the Major Seminary of the Archdiocese of Krakow. Cardinal Reisch is uh, also a member of the Dicastery for Bishops of First since November 2020 and a member of the Dicastery of uh, Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments. Welcome, Cardinal. It is also my great pleasure to introduce Father Ricardo Lufrani, a professor of theology and historical reality at Notre Dame, Rome, and a professor of theology at LUMSA as well, here in Rome. Um, from 2008 to 2014, he fought uh, of um, topography of Jerusalem, uh, the Ecole Biblique et Archeologique uh, Francais in Jerusalem. Welcome, welcome, Father. And obviously, um, Father Cesare Binkiewicz, who in his modesty did not uh, introduce himself, but everybody knows um, uh, he's a Polish Dominican and doctor of philosophy. And he, first of all, he's a director of the Saint Paul, Saint Paul, he's a director of the Saint, Paul, Saint John Paul II Institute of Culture here at the Angelicum as well. Welcome, Father. So after, after listening to those two wonderful lectures given by um, Professor Michal Paluch and Professor Remy Brack, I would like to open our um, discussion uh, with like empirical experience, because obviously we are in Rome, which is one of the most beautiful, for many, the most beautiful a uh, city in the world, uh, built by great artists, um, created by wonderful monuments of history. And I would like to ask you, uh, Eminence, um, first question, because for many years, also here in Rome, the church has um, been supporting the arts and the artists, um, especially, of course, in the Middle Ages, but also later on. 
can we shortly try to describe the, the situation today? And uh, can we try to answer the question, can you try to answer the question, uh, what is the spiritual significance of art? I am not an artist. Mm. I would start with this statement that church always supported the artists, because this is not true. And um, I would start with the statement that at least for first four centuries, it was forbidden to be an artist and to be a Christian. And if somebody wanted to be a Christian, he couldn't be an artist. And it is uh, the first art, Christian art in Rome. If you go to catacombs, or if you go to Vatican museums to see all the sarcophagus left from the primitive church, third, fourth century, they were surely died by, done by pagan artists, not by Christians because an art in a majority was an act of idolatry. What did the artists make? What did they sculpture? What did they paint it? Majority, they, they sculptured or painted the pagan gods. And uh, to be an artist meant also to, uh, to spur idolatry in the world. So if you go to Vatican necropolis and to see the first image of Christ as a rising sun, he's portrayed as a, a, a god of sun, Helios, surrounded by vine, like Dionysos. So there is no sense. Yeah. But it was made by a pagan artist who was asked by a Christian, so do me such a mosaic here. Yeah. Helios on his, uh, well, with his horses and so on, uh, surrounded by vine. And the pagan artist did it. Mm -hmm. And he had no idea he's portraying Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the very first centuries of Christianity, there was no, there was no any covenant between the church and artists. And um, then uh, we go to the time of uh, early Middle Ages, and they will agree. I mean, the, for instance, the popes, the most famous, my patron saint, Gregory the Great, who said, "Art is useful because it is." Literatura e literatorum. For many people who do not know uh, the letters, they cannot read the Bible, so we need to paint the Bible, or we need to sculpture the Bible on the walls. So the art is useful. But to what, to what degree? To what degree? Uh, I remember from um, my previous life, because I used to be historian, before, before I, they made me a bishop. Uh, there is a wonderful text by Theodulf of Orléans uh, named Libri Carolini. And this is the official answer of uh, the court of Charlemagne after the Council of Nicaea II, 787. Yeah. Uh, Theodulf speaks about the possibility of, uh, of the cult of a picture. And he says, how someone can, can say that the, the, the picture is holy? What is holy? Nothing is holy in the picture. There's nothing holy. Uh, how can someone say that it is useful? You paint a, a young woman and you need to describe that this is Our Lady. Otherwise, they will think this is Venus. So, the word, the word is a good instrument to 
to, to pass the revelation. Picture not, because picture is a weak instrument. And at the end, well, in a sense it's weak, and in, in the other sense it's very strong. Because when you see the picture, you will never free yourself from this picture. You will exactly know how Our Lady looks like. Yeah? You saw one picture, is enough. We know that Our, Our Lady looked like Our Lady of Częstochowa. It's obvious. <laughs> yeah. It's enough if you saw it once in life. Yeah. So the, the picture, in, in a sense, enslaves you, enslaves your imagination. And you can, the, uh, I don't know how, how are your experiences from your childhood. The first picture of God the Father I have is from my parish church. I've been five years old and I saw God the Father and I know how he does he look like. Yeah. Because it goes, it goes very deep into your imagination. Yeah? So this is what already theologians on the court of Charlemagne, they were afraid of. The, yeah, and they were conscious of it. Yeah, so this is, not, uh, this is not the obvious story, this, uh, this dialogue and connection of art and artists with the church. Yeah? And you, you can easily see it from the beginning. Well, maybe then... If I can interrupt you in, uh, yes. in that very moment, um, Your Eminence, uh, thank you for this like, very broad picture about the, the relation between um, church and the culture and history. Uh, but would you be so kind to answer the question, how does it look like today, in your opinion, the relation between the church and the culture, church and the arts, today? I would start with what Father Michael said during his lecture. Yeah. He started with a picture of naive John Paul trying to speak to artists. Yeah. And um, no, no, yeah, I am also a naive bishop. <laughs> uh, I think that this letter. It is a sign of dream. There is a dream. And this is not just a dream of John Paul. I think that the first one to dream in such a way in the modern church was Paul VI. Yeah? You, you take the messages uh, of Paul VI for the end of, of the council. Yeah? There are seven messages written by him, and they are written to seven several groups, yeah? the workers, women, youth, artists, politicians, sick people, I don't know, so one is missing. Anyway, all those messages say, believe us, we are your friends. This is the reference. The, the word friend is the reference of those messages. So Pope says, we are your friends. Why? Because the whole 19th century, we have been no friends at all. And there is a gap between the church and art, the church and politics, the church and government, the church, economics, everything. Yeah? We are divided. We are split. And so, this is a dream. Yeah? After the years of being together, and after at least an age, I think two ages, being completely divided and separated, there is a dream that we can, we can be friends again. And this is a part of the answer. And then the second, um, the art and the church at the end have to meet in a person inside. This is not only a question of uh, meeting two uh, realities or whatever, no. I like very much this sentence by John Paul that uh, if the faith is not seen in the culture, it is still not major. The, the major faith has to find an expression in art and in culture. If it does not, it is not major. The major faith is not in the church. 
the nature of faith is in you, in me, in you, always in a person. Yeah? The, the, the person nature in faith produces the Christian art, otherwise not. Yeah? Um, and when we speak about person, the, the last, okay? Because I, ver I am very grateful to Father Michael that he called uh, Saint Brother Albert, uh, one of the best Polish painters in 19th and 20th century. And being an artist, he had the idea that everyone is an artist. Everyone. Because at the end, you show yourself through everything you do. Yeah? So you, uh, you are artists, and you can see it when you see the way you put your flowers in your room. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You are artists or you are not. Yeah, if your flowers are always put in the same way, means you are never, you are never been the artist. Yeah. Uh, but this is what he used to say in the beginning, when he started uh, painting in uh, Minchen, in uh, yeah, in Minchen. But then, being already a painter. He used to say that, uh, again, the, the, the art can be idolatry. And idolatry demanding very much from you. A lot of, yeah. The, the, the art is an idol. This is his idea, yeah. Can take all your spirit, everything. You will give everything. You will give up everything for being an artist. And um, so there was a moment he entered Jesuits and he started to paint again. And for him, it was a moment crucial in life because he, now I can paint being a religious fellow. Yeah? Because to become like Fra Angelico, yeah? So he's painting no more for himself. He still paints what he has inside. But inside there is no idol Adam Chmielowski. Yeah? Inside is extra homo. Yeah? And he tries to, to, to put it into art. Yeah? But uh, for a fellow who was not a... Uh, theoretical thinker about art, but one of the best painters. He, in him, there was a fear that uh, art can become, in your life, an act of idolatry. Yeah? When you are good enough, and if you want to be recognized, if you want to have your pictures on every exhibition, everywhere, yeah? and it is not a dialogue even for him. There was a moment they refused to accept his paintings for the exhibition. I say, how dare they are? How could they? They are good pictures. I did my best. They are good pictures. Why didn't they take them? So, so the art is good in itself. It is not a way to dialogue with somebody. Yeah. So, The last, maybe the last sentence, because of Wojtyla, again, uh, and his romanticism. When, when you were saying that, I, I, I was thinking about him being an actor during the war. But this is the, this is the spirit of an artist. There is a war. You are expected to take gun and to fight. And his decision is not to fight, to do the play and to write the play. He started to, he, he wrote Hiop, he wrote uh, the first, at least the first reduction of Brother of Our God. So he was writing during the war. Yeah? And uh, this is a question of hope. When there is, when there is, War, where is the hope? 
19th century Romanticism was a question about hope in Poland. All those artists, the greatest artists, poets, uh, Chopin, all of them, the greatest question was hope, hope, not against God, from him, with him. Yeah? So the hope, the hope comes with the art, with the inner life. The, yeah, the art constructs a man, makes him different. After war, he will be needed because he will be different because of the art. Yeah, so this is the hope. This is a dream. This, this is not a naive way of thinking. This is a dream. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, Eminence, for those, those remarks. And thank you very much for the, like, opening the, the whole level of discussion about the um, role of the artist uh, today. Because the document we are discussing um, today is that letter to artists, to artists. So, Father Cesare, I would like to ask you now about the, the social responsibility, the role of the artist today. His Eminence Cardinal said that John Paul II was creating, was writing during the war looking for hope um, and finding the hope also in his art. So I was wondering, um, like, the, the letter of, uh, to artists uh, was published in 1999, uh, 25 years ago. I was wondering, what was the John Paul II point of view on the role of the artist then? What had changed now? And what's the role of the artist today? Are we, are, are we still looking for a hope in art, in culture, or maybe something has changed? Oh, thank you. It's, it's not easy because, uh, uh, as uh, Michał said during the lecture, contemporary art is a little detached from the, from the beauty. Uh, uh, um, Arturo Danto, in his book, uh, The Abuse of Beauty, showed it perfectly perfectly well uh, that um, contemporary artists uh, uh, don't, wa don't want work, uh, arts pieces uh, according, to the, according to the beauty. Uh, but for church, this uh, uh, three concept, uh, beauty, true and good, are very important. So, so how is this connection? Uh, between art and uh, church uh, in the contemporary world. I think that we still have, have, can have hope uh, because even, uh, even the, the beauty was detached from the, from the art in contemporary times. Uh, so uh, I suppose that uh, the purpose of art is still create things of value. I, I think that each of art is think about his piece of art or her piece of art as a thing of value. So it means, so it means that uh, value is, is in a sense a relative idea, relative idea. So this relative idea gives us a hope uh, uh, that some, we can still uh, say about some kind, of, some kind of values because each of these artists in the end have to state that his, her piece of, piece of art is made with succeed or without succeed. Uh, so there is a such kind of, such kind of uh, value. And, and, the second, and the second point is that uh, it seems that two moments are crucial in art. Uh, and I think that they, they are present in the Michal lectures. Uh, the nature with all its richness and the artist's dream, which wants to transcend nature. So these two, these two uh, features are present in, in, in art. Um, and if this is the case, then I'm convinced that sacred art has a future, because nowhere is this desire to transcend, to go beyond, more present than in religion. Uh, so I still have hope uh, that even last decades, artists were detached from religion, faith, from Catholic Church, from, from, from Christianity. It's still hope 
that we can uh, discover this, uh, this transcendency always present in, in the art. Thank you very much. Before we'll be talking about transcendency, I would like to ask you, Father Lufrani, one more question about the role of the artist today. Because John Paul II, in his letter, is writing a lot about the dialogue between the church and the artists, the intellectual background, and he's presenting art and beauty as kind of like a bridge between two worlds. But as far as I know, you are also working with artists, like guiding them somehow. Um, can I ask you a little bit more personal question than intellectual question, like from your experience? Uh, what's our artists today, what, what are the artists looking now in the church? What are they expecting from the church, from the faith? What kind of difficulties, problems they're finding with the dialogue with the church? Well, I, I think that artists do not uh, expect anything from the church. They have a, mm -hmm. a, such a normal idea of, of the church that is common to our uh, society, our culture, that they uh, think that they cannot learn anything. So this is the passage of uh, uh, St. Paul uh, the Sixth, that actually he uh, founded the UCAI, the Unione Cattolica degli Artisti Italiani at the Minerva, uh, right after the war, um, because of uh, his uh, consciousness of the importance of the role of uh, artists and art in, in culture. And so the problem is this disconnection of the church from um, from culture. That is, I guess, the main <laughs> question of this uh, panel and today. So, I, um, as I, I said in my uh, intervention uh, to Paolo, uh, to Brother Michael, um, interesting um, conference, uh, that there is, there has been a shift uh, an ontological shift in the historical reality that has not been acknowledged by anybody, uh, and especially by the church. So um, in, in the sacral static society that were, um, before the spreading of the Industrial Revolution that dynamized the, um, the historical reality, the society tended to reproduce itself. If you were a peasant, your son was going to be a peasant. So, and history was not really a problem. Uh, in this period, it's a, st a static, sacral society. Religion has the role of, let's say, as, as analogically speaking, as a soul of the society. Religion gives the values, the norms, and also the knowledge. And so this is the role that the church has played uh, um, greatly uh, for the profit of everybody in this period of time. Then with this, what uh, De Maria calls the uh, humanist interlude, progressively the absolute that is, um, the true absolute that is God has been um, replaced by a pseudo absolute that is uh, man progressively, and uh, that at the same time, uh, the, the society, the, the historical reality became uh, dynamic, so everything is changing, and we are experiencing now uh, how this change is accelerating, because it, it is connected to technology, and, to, and technology is connected uh, to the fact that in Ontologically speaking, the dynamization of the historical reality is produced by taking the energy from nature and pouring it into history. And the, the, the more developed is the capacity to do so, the, the faster is the um, dynamization of uh, the society. And it seems uh, something uh, bad because we, everything was going well and now we have something uh, new. Well, God either wants it or allows it. 
And there is a very um, um, clear hermeneutical key for me that I don't know if I interpret it uh, rightly. That is Romans uh, 8, 28. Everything concurs to the good of those who love God. Everything, not almost everything. So we must find what is in good that can be um, uh, transfigured in a greater good if it's an evil together with God in everything. So what this dynamization of the society uh, of the historical reality brings, the, 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 um, the matrix, the cultural matrix I said before uh, just well, is, is completely upside down. So now it's knowledge that gives the value. Uh, and also the way that you interpret religion, if religion has any place, it means to be uh, um, concrete. So I know how works, for example, the, um, I, I, I think I know how it works scientifically, the, the formation of the gender identity. So I create values that is, well, you must be free to choose your gender identity as you want, especially if you are a child because culture influences you. So is this the process? And our, the values of our society comes from knowledge that most of the time is not right, but this is the, the mechanism, let's say, the, the dynamism. And so in this epoch that is uh, secular and uh, dynamic, the most important science, because reason has replaced a re revelation and faith as the, the, the force that gives the, the, the understanding of a reality, is metaphysics. And a metaphysics of the historical reality. So what is happening now? Uh, before, and this is uh, uh, quite shocking maybe, but I hope it's going to shock uh, most of you, uh, in the status, uh, uh, static sacral society, uh, the society was not really Christian, it was inspired, but not really Christian. I give always the example of Santa Rita da Cascia, and to my students I make a, a trick, so most of my students are not believers of, of, of other uh, religions, and, and so I tell them the story without telling uh, who is this uh, lady. So she was married uh, to a man, a grown man, when she was 12, and uh, um, then she was very pious, she prayed, and his, 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 um, her husband wasn't a believer, he became to believe, not explicitly to which uh, faith, and then he has been killed, and they had two children. You know the story, okay? So they, I asked to my students, so where and when is this story? And some of them say Afghanistan today it sounds similar. In this period, in, in Italy, so it's the 15th century? 14th? 15th? Yes, so uh, vengeance was a pillar of the functioning mechanism of the society. Obligatory. Uh, yes, and she couldn't enter the, the monastery as a widow without children, she couldn't survive, because one of the nuns in the monastery was for the family of uh, uh, her husband, and she didn't want her to enter the monastery because she didn't take revenge. And I can give you, we can make a, um, a synopsis how we treated women, children, disabled people, and so on. So to have this idea uh, that the society was Christian before and now it's not, well, we should study it uh, thoroughly. So why it wasn't possible for Christianity, that is a dynamic form, right? I use here the ilemorphic uh, theory of Aristotle, not to substances, but consider society as a, a matter, and the form is something that comes from above, that in our uh, current world is given by the ideology that gives shapes to our societies. And the main two uh, ideologies that give 
the shape to our societies are the liberal capitalistic ideology and the communist ideology, both atheomaterialistic. And so what we have to develop is this wisdom of the, let's say, the dynamism of form and matter, where the form is the Christ, but not directly as in the static sacral society, but through what is an ideology. And we can see that, uh, again, at St. Paul VI, he uh, had this uh, inspiration for the Pentecost of 1970, uh, 17 May, where he pronounced a, a speech, a, a message for the Regina Celli, and he, a few lines, he said that Pentecost is the beginning the, of a new society, of the new world, that is the civilization of love and peace. And he said it was inaugurated that day, and we have to build a civilization of love and peace. So. And since then, and even Pope uh, St. John Paul II, I, I found a quote, uh, all the popes since, and most of the, 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 there is a chapter also in the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, there is this idea that we have to build a civilization of love. So we have to develop the wisdom of what is a civilization of love and how we do build it. And which is the role of the artist? That is huge. For you, the answering yeah. that question, uh, Your Eminence, because you... I, I'm thinking all the time about uh, this question, what do the artists expect from the church? And I, I will say from the experience, we have in Wuch uh, the church for artists. And uh, we have 200 of them coming to this church for Sunday Mass. They created uh, the theater 30 years ago, and still is, it, it is run by them. Uh, there's also an exhibition for the paintings and sculpture and so on. I think there's a great community of artists coming there, hoping that what they do is important for the church, not as an organization or structure, but um, as a community serving the people and humanity. And what is important is the question about what does it mean to be human being? And um, because, for instance, in the theater, they play Wojtyła, yes, but they play Ionescu, they play Dante, and for instance, during the pandemia, they made Dante, Hell and Purgatory. Reading the time, this is a prophetic uh, job, to read the time, and to understand the time, and to understand a person, a human being, yeah, uh, in the time of pandemia. Probably what they did was much more important than many sermons in the churches, and probably much deeper. So I think that they come to the church because they still believe that uh, the church is a place for human being, and for human person, and for human community, and that the church in is interested in what does it mean to be human, not only what does it mean to be Christian, what does it mean to be a human person. That's why they come to the church. At least I can say it from what, what I experience when I meet them. Yeah? And, and there's quite a big community. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, like, well, sticking to that point, uh, um, I would like to reverse that question because uh, I ask what artists are expecting from the church. So we are having this discussion 25 years after that document, the letter of John Paul II to artists. Um, so what, what does the church want from the artist after those 
25 years. Because like, for me, it seems that uh, Karol Wojtyla started to work on that letter many years before he wrote it. Uh, because in 1962, he, he wrote a um, kind of um, meditations to artists, and he delivered them to the artist in Krakow in 1962. Uh, so it was a long time before he wrote the letter to artists as, as we know it today. So if we would be able to reverse the question, so what does the church want from the artist right now, after 25 years of, after the publication of the letter to artists of John Paul II? I will first try to answer, and then I will say that this is not the question uh, which is important. Okay. But um, the answer would be, uh, if you take Desiderio Desideravi by Francis, this is one of the favorite my documents uh, now. Mm -hmm. It starts with uh, the revelation, that the revelation comes to us through words and signs. And the problem is that we are now illiterati mm -hmm. in reading the signs, not the letters. This is Pope's statement. Yeah? We cannot today read the signs. And uh, if we cannot read the signs, we are completely uh, without any chances to, for instance, to enter liturgy. The liturgy is a code of signs. We, we don't know the language of signs. There's no way for us to live the liturgy. Mm. Yeah? So this is a crucial moment. We need somebody to learn us, to teach us how to read the signs. Now, this, is the, the, this is the task for artists, surely. But... Um, I said that this is not as important question because the important question is the previous one. Because the church is not for itself. Yeah? That this is the main idea of today. That the church is not for the church. The church is for the world. So the church is for the people, not the people for us. This is, this is really important. Yeah? So the question important is what what we as a church can do for the artists, yeah? not what they can do for us. Of course, yeah, uh, we need them, it's obvious, and so on. But um, um, the church is sent to the world, yeah? and not to just take care about herself. Yeah? And this is, this is the most important point for me. Yeah? So uh, I really prefer to ask what I can offer to, to the world, also the world of art, than to, to ask what they can offer to me, yeah? because I need it as a, as, a, as a church, and we need the church in the world, and we need the structure, we need Christianity, so let, us, let them work for us. No, this is, this is not the right, the right direction. But this uh, answer about reading the signs, I, I, find, I found, find important. Yeah? This is what we, we need them as the guides to read the signs. Yeah. Um, also to speak through the signs. There are many Dominicans here. I admired also always Father Gura uh, from Lednica in Poland. He, he had this uh, uh, talent, the, the gift yeah, to speak through signs. Yeah. He had this, he had this. Yeah. If you can show something, it's much better to show it than to talk about it in today's world. Yeah? So that's why we need artists. Yeah? Surely we need them. Father yeah. um, well, thank you, Your Eminence, for, for those, those remarks. Um, I would like to ask you about a little bit another question, not about artists, I mean the people, but about the culture itself, because it seems, um, well, we were mentioning many poets during today's conference. There was Rilke in the talk of um, uh, Professor Bragg, um, but my favorite Polish poet, Zbigniew Herbert, was also very much touched to the art culture, especially ancient culture. And since that for many Poles and people living under the communist regime in the 70s and 80s, uh, art 
and culture were those aspects of life that help many to live a better life. So do you think that it is also possible today that there is a type of art, maybe it's music, uh, which Father, uh, Professor Paluk mentioned, that is helping people to live a better life today and elevating them to God? Try to answer to your question, I, I, I ask you a question. What do you mean for better life? Yeah, be, yeah because it depends what we mean. Of course, if uh, from an idealistic point of view, um, uh, that is our culture, uh, well, art is used to, to live a better life at all uh, all levels. So you make art to make money, and you are famous. You are rich, or you just uh, relax, or I don't know. But art, as uh, anyway, um, uh, let's say, as by its essence, if it's true arts, it puts uh, us into. Um, a deeper connection with reality that the, at, the, at the end of the day has something to do with uh, the divine, so with God. And so even now, uh, there, there are, um, are artists and uh, artworks, uh, I guess, of any kind of arts, I, I, can, uh, I can think about, for example, uh, Avro Pert, uh, in music, um, uh, that who produce something that, uh, in this case, is uh, Avro Pert is uh, clearly spiritual and uh, religious, but n not necessarily he, pr he produce, for example, a, a music for mm -hmm. the death of uh, one of his friends, and it's just probably the expression of. Uh, his, his feelings at uh, Pari Interval, I don't know if you know him, this, this piece. And it resounds with others, for me, for example. And, and so um, I think that the, also we have to consider that the king of the universe is Christ, the resurrected, and he is at work. We have to remember that we, have, we are created uh, out of love by God, who is love, and so we tend uh, against all odds to naturally to to live this life with God if we know we don't want. And art, true art, is this connection. Um, there are artists that are not believers, and maybe even uh, declare artists that. In, in effect, without knowing it, they put us in connection with Christ. So um, it would be, uh, I think, suitable to, to have a clear vision of what culture is and how it works, let's say, so that we can really become, as church, the, 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 the first, uh, provider of wisdom of the, of for for the world uh, that is uh, what is uh, requested by the world they, uh, they, they the world uh, needs to be saved and this is the salvific function of the church through the sacraments but also enlightened by the church and enlightened by what? By the wisdom of our mother and uh, magistra, who has this wisdom, but has to find a way to, uh, to catch the, the time, understand, using the, the right uh, tools. I say, uh, I'm trying to, uh, in, my, in the university where I teach, that are both uh, Catholic universities, to show to my colleagues, professor of economics and other uh, subjects, that at the light of the revelation, you can work uh, scientifically with, uh, uh, with greater uh, efficacy and uh, 
And an example uh, um, that I can give you when uh, I participated to a, a, a series of con uh, conferences organized by the Pontifical University, uh, uh, the Faculty of uh, Philosophy of uh, the Salesian Pontifical University on the change of epoch. And so the first... Uh, quote from Pope Francis that we are living yes, in the yes. change of the epoch. Mm -hmm. So the first was about economy and a change of epoch. And the first lecture was given by a professor of economics of uh, LUMSA who said, well, um, the latest research in... Uh, the economy of firms are uh, studying the, the, the importance of the principle of the common good. And he added, the church has been speaking about the principle of the common good for centuries, but he didn't make the, the, the next passage, the logic passage. How come the church have this wisdom? And so if I am a Catholic econo uh, economist, Instead of wasting my time studying other ways to understand what is crucial, the, I don't know, the marginal uh, uh, utility and all this stuff, I just see what Revelation tells me, where I look, and I find, because it's inscribed in reality, so I find the intelligibility that I can... Uh, prove scientifically with the scientific method. And so I'm trying to, to, to let uh, the other uh, professor know how we have to use theology and revelation in every field, not substituting it as it was in the static sacral, so the, the, the earth is flat, but going to, to look for uh, truth at the scientific level where we have indication from the, the, the revelation. This is something that must be developed in the church and this is a very uh, a crucial service of the church to the society and to culture. In, in, in his letter to artists in, in point 14, uh, the Pope is asking artists to participate in the common good of society somehow. Uh, Father Cesare, like, how is it possible to do it today? Like, common good and culture and artists today, um, how is it combined? How it can be combined today? You know, when we are going back to this letter, uh, St. Paul to artists, so what has very attracted me, uh, it was the connection between responsibility and and, and, uh, and culture and art, uh, because we probably all, all agree that uh, the most important uh, feature of the art is a freedom. You know? uh, and uh, each of artists uh, uh, underlined this, uh, this feature that uh, he creates because of, of his own freedom. You know? but, but I think that it's very important to remember that freedom without responsibility uh, became real slave, uh, and and John Paul II uh, tried to uh, show uh, that uh, this responsibility is very important when he is talking about uh, arts or, or culture and common good, uh, especially especially today, especially today because uh, uh, mostly uh, we are. Uh, observer of the some kind space of art which became performance it became performance and observer uh, become uh, participant of this uh, of this uh, uh, piece of art and and this is why uh, i think that uh, artists cannot be cannot suspend them from this responsibility even even sometimes art shock so uh, the, the art should have a purpose of this shock. Without this purpose, uh, uh, it became empty, become empty. Uh, so so that's, that's, that's thing, I think, that's it's very important. I agree with uh, Cardinal that church is for, for people, not for itself. But uh, as a church, as a people in the church, we also should remember uh, 
that uh, we have responsibilities for others, yeah? and uh, that we, uh, our creation, our arts can influ influence people over and uh, maybe good art and, and bad art, yeah. So, so I like uh, I like this uh, distinguishing in uh, Professor Struzewski uh, last last book, and, and when uh, when he distinct uh, where he's distinguished between uh, between beauty you know, on three levels: ethical levels, phenomenological levels, and metaphysical levels. So. On this aesthetical level, uh, beauty uh, is uh, uh, because of the because of the uh, some kind of likeness or dislikeness, uh, yeah. And even ugliness can be described or pictured in a very beautiful way. So some things uh, I like, some things I don't like. And so that's the aesthetical level. But there is a, a higher level. Uh, which is an uh, epistemological level, and when we try to find what is common for beauty, what is the universal for beauty. And the last moment, the last metaphysical moment of the beauty, uh, for me is the most important, and I think the, the, the hardest level, be, because uh, we treat on this level beauty as an um, explendor of the existence. Expl uh, 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 splendor of the existence, yeah, and and that's uh, that's the level show that everything what exists is beauty, because existence uh, has each splendor. So, so when we sometimes uh, looking for the key concept between this beauty, good, and truth, uh, I think that we we can risk uh, the judgment that, uh, that the beauty is the most important. Because in this, way, in this way, we can speak about the beauty of the creation and we can, uh, we can talk about the uh, herrlich kind uh, of God, so uh, glory, of the, glory of the God. And, um, and also we can transmute uh, uh, transmute good as a as a beauty of the spiritual life, and uh, truth as a, a splendor of existence. Yeah, a splendor of existence, beauty of existence. So, so I think that the the corner cornerstone of this tree transcendental uh, transcendental concept, the beauty is the most important, and maybe this is why. I mean, this is why we didn't remember about it. So, so uh, good and truth is on the first <laughs> plane. But, uh, but if beauty is on the sand, so that's why uh, we usually cannot participate in it. But the, the most important for me. Thank you very much for, for that. We, we are talking a lot about beauty uh, today and uh, I would like to ask you, Eminence, a question about beauty. Uh, a question which could be a little bit, um, well, maybe not strange, but you said that there, is a, there was, in the, for many years, a disconnection between the church and different groups of the people, between the church and some aspects of, of life. I was wondering, maybe that would be a naive question, but uh, you thought that you mentioned that beauty of creation, of God's plan of, of creation. Do you think, Yemen, is that uh, beauty as a concept, beauty as a theological concept, can be kind of a bridge which can fill the gap between the church and different aspects of human life? What I can say is that there is a lot of talking about it now in the church. Um, there is a passage in the, in the last document of the Synod on synodality from October about new aesthetics. So you have uh, the bishops talking with the Pope about aesthetics. And, but on the other side, you can take Kiko Arguello saying that uh, new aesthetics will save the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, so, and uh, this is a quotation in all the catechesis on the way. 
So from one side you have um, the government of the church, on the other side you have and the order, and the other side you have a charisma uh, with the same idea, yeah, new aesthetics. Uh, we'll save the world. I don't know. I'm just thinking that uh, the most important instrument of so-called evangelization is dialogue. So if you enter dialogue, you take a person as she or he is, and you just try to listen. And um, so to know today's art is on our side, there's a question if you want to listen to the people or not, because they say something about themselves, about the values they, they share. They speak about, about their life through the art. That's why I am interesting. I want to listen. If I do not listen, there is no evangelization. And it, it was always the case. Yeah? The evangelization is not just one way teaching. You need to, to hear what the other side say. And, um, that's why it is important. Mm. The second idea I have, I don't know if it is the answer for your question, but uh, Michal also asked this question about shift you know, from uh, theocentrism to anthropocentrism. If you study uh, medieval art, you will never know the names of the artists. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you say at the end, the master of Autun. Yeah? But you do not know the name. Yeah? You know the work of art. You find a similar somewhere. So you say, this is the same author, the master of. Yeah? But you do not know the name. Because they knew they, they, they do the art not for themselves. There was no signature, never. Never. And uh, what, what, the, what is striking it was not a question of matter. If he does a sculpture in the main altar or he does a sculpture near the roof 20 meters from down, and he knew that nobody will see it. And it is done as perfect as the main statue in the main altar. Why? Because he knew he does, he, he, it was not for him. Okay. And then, uh, let us come back to Krakow for the moment. You go to Wawel Cathedral, there is the first Renaissance chapel, Zygismondus chapel. Mm -hmm. And the name of the artist put into doom, Bartholomew of Florence did it. And the doom in the, in the church is a, is a sign of heaven. So he says about himself, I am in heaven. To be an artist means to be in heaven. And this is the heavenly task to be an artist. And you need to remember my name. That this is this shift here. Yeah? And it is not like uh, Anselm Cur Deus Homo. This is also the shift. Cur Deus Homo. But this is not the same way. Yeah? This is not the same style of the shift. Yeah. So. yeah, I I will finish with this idea that the art is a place of dialogue between church and modern men, and uh, uh, not only modern, always, it used, it used to be a place of dialogue, and it is dialogue important for both sides, and in that sense it is important for evangelization, because there's no evangelization if I don't know to whom I speak, yeah, and uh, whom I meet in, 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 in this task, yeah, this is a meeting place, you know, this is a very important 
and I, 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 I can miss the art of Middle Ages, and I will never meet a person uh, talking to me uh, in, through modern art, yeah? because uh -huh, I like uh, Gregorian chant. Yeah, I like also, but I speak to a fellow who does not understand Latin, not only Latin, <laughs> Gregorian chant. So I need to listen to him and to his music. Otherwise, we will never meet. Yeah. I need to ask another question about the listening part, the eminence. How we as a church, like reversing the, uh, the way of thinking, how we as a church can listen through art? Is it possible? Well, it is, but the, 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 key, is, the key feature is freedom. Yeah. Because th there is no meeting. If there is no freedom on both sides, there is no meeting. Yeah? And um, we must be honest towards the artists and t towards the men. We need, we need to be honest. Yeah? They, 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 they need to know that this is not a uh, way of manipulation. Yeah? We meet with them to manipulate them. No, this is not a dialogue. Yeah? If we meet really, if we are interested really in listening to the people, I think the meeting will come. If not, they will not come. Yeah. They do not come, there is no listening. <laughs> yeah, there's no chance. Mm -hmm. Speaking about freedom, uh, you, Father Lufran, you said that um, artists are not expecting anything from the church right now, from, from your experience. Well, why is it? Is it because of the lack of trust. freedom, trust? Many, many elements or causes is, is very complex, but uh, mainly I guess that is, the, oh, I, I, I speak about Italy, so there are still many prejudices against the church and also the idea of what the church is and which is the real teaching of the church <clears throat> uh, is known by, by few people. So um, we have, we have uh, as an association, uh, the UKAI, uh, uh, different um, um, sections in different cities and each one has a, um, an ecclesiastical uh, assistant and uh, in some cases there are problems in because they don't want to whether it's a, a Catholic association but so uh, the cardinal uh, um, is right we have to meet them uh, by listening and we have to understand the world we have to be in the world actually we should we don't judge the world we have here to serve the, the world and actually we learn even better what we are as as church and which is our service in this exchange because it's an exchange that is uh, guided by the the spirit and of course if we pray and uh, we ask the to to fulfill the, the the most important commandment to go to love everybody as Jesus loved them well, I, I will present myself in, in a way that is, uh, of course, welcoming and at service and will probably uh, produce a, a positive reaction. But this love is, is with, goes with this idea that I am learning well, always when I am exchanging. When I, I make spiritual guidance, for me, is the one who profits the more, it's me because it's the Holy Spirit that is there. And so it's the occasion for both of us to, to go deeper into a reality of life. So I need to be with the other and I need to be in dialogue with the other, not only for the sake of the other, but for my sake too. And we are one in a way, connected or not connected by the grace, but God is at work with everybody. 
So, so if I, if yes. I can, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that um, uh, we have to distinguish two important things uh, with this relation of artists and church. The first one uh, coming from history. Uh, church was uh, the biggest mecenat of the, of the artist uh, before, and this is why uh, artists need, needed church. Because of the because the money, uh, the the second the second point is that now I think church went a little too, too far to the kitsch, a little far to the kitsch, and this is why, and this is why uh, mm, there is no uh, needs for something exclusive, needs of something exclusive. I think that church still have possibility uh, to be a mecenat for for really good art, really, really good art, in music, in painting, and, and others. And in the end, I still believe what I uh, said on the beginning, that in the art, does do to this the most important feature, nature and desire to be, trans to transcend this nature. And religion is the, the most important thing with this thinking of transcendency. It was for ages, it was from the beginning, and it is still to, till today. Till today. Uh, uh, desire to transcend uh, our day life, our day life. And that's the, that's the desire of artists also. So church and arts can meet in this point. And, and that's, uh, I think, in this way. Thank you very much for that uh, intervention because, well, we'll be concluding the, the conference, but I would really like to end with some optimistic point of view because we've been speaking about the crisis. You, your man, your man said that there was a constant crisis and constant uh, kind of oh, division. Not at, all. Okay. not at all. I would really like to finish with some optimistic um, words, your eminence, can we, what can we find today in the letter of John Paul II, which can guide us in the relation between the church and the culture, the church and art? I think the hope is in the letter itself, because Pope was an artist, so he was a meeting place of art and faith, and uh, the same I wish to everyone here. So we should be doing art in that sense. Yeah. Okay, Father. Well, if I am not wrong, next uh, year there is uh, the um, jubilee, as it's about hope to uh, wake up the hope. So uh, we have to just trust God, who will uh, guide us. But we have to understand to put our efforts, but. He, at the end, is the, uh, is the master of, uh, of, the, of the history of salvation. So the, we just have to be united as much as possible uh, in connection uh, uh, in the church, try to dialogue also with other confessions and, and progress, but, and bring hope in the world with the a vision of the future, and for me, uh, what is lacking most, I see it with, uh, with my students, is that they don't have a positive uh, vision of the future. That, in a way, is, is good, because the one that has been presented to them before was a materialistic, positive, and so deceiving uh, way of uh, hoping for the future. So to us is to have this vision of building a civilization of love and peace that is not odontopia, says uh, uh, um, Pope St. John Paul II, is something that we can and must build. So this is the hope that we should present to the, to the people, to the world. Before I will give you a voice, uh, Father, there is a time for questions questions from the audience. So if there is anyone who would like to ask a question, uh, as the... Uh, I have to go with the... Yes, sure.
Sure, obviously. So thank you very much, uh, Father. Father needs to go. There is a flight waiting for you. So thank you very much for your participation and for the discussion. Thank you very much. Information. Uh, I would like to kindly invite you for a beautiful exhibition, which is an example of cooperation between artists and church and, and St. John Paul II Institute of Culture. Uh, the exhibition is in San Salvatore in Lauro. It's the Annunciation, so it's sacral art, uh, and uh, paintings are um, prepared by distinguished Polish painters. So please. Uh, Visit the exhibition. It's available till One Saturday the only. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. One of them is even Dominican. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. One of these artists is present with us today during yes. this conference. Yes, exactly. Bogna so, Podbielska is with so, us. So this is why I still have hope that it is possible. So any, any questions? Yes, over. over. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. I listened very intently to the, to the discussion. Um, and there were lots of seeds I picked up. Um, I think I'll just restrict myself to, to the last one, which is we kept talking in terms of the church artists. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, we're actually thinking in governmental terms, in uh, uh, Foucault's governmentality. What is the problem with thinking in, in governmental terms is that you miss the individual